host. Oh, okay. Okay, hello and welcome to this Atheist Republic discussion. Today, I'm Susanna. We have a very special guest, Dr. Leo Igwe, who is a skeptical educator and humanist activist in Nigeria. Our discussion today will focus on an update on the status of Mubarak Bala, who is the president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria, who was arrested on April 28th, um, seemingly on charges of public disturbance and cyber crime due to a Facebook post he made about the Prophet Muhammad. We will also be discussing Igwe's work with the Advocacy for Alleged Witches Project and the current issues facing atheists and non-believers in Nigeria today. So, to first begin with the case of Lamar Bala, uh, to those not familiar, like I said, he's the president of the Humanist Association of Nigeria, and he had previously been detained and forcibly drugged in the psychiatric ward when his family found out that he was an atheist in 2014, and he was freed due to international support. Now he's in trouble again, and this is due to a petition that was brought forth signed by some 16,000 people um, demanding his arrest. Um, Leo, uh, can you tell us more about this case? Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, yes, um, we really have a very serious issue in our hands because um, a little over a week ago, um, Mubarak Bala, one of our very staunch members, and um, the president of, uh, of the Humanist Association of Nigeria was arrested. Um, but Mubarak Bala is, um, um, is not a stranger to this kind of experience, uh, in the sense that um, about, uh, that was in 2014, he was um, drugged, taken to a mental hospital, because uh, he, he renounced Islam. Period. So he was uh, posting comments and saying things that um, the family considered to be incompatible with their own understanding of who a Muslim is, a Muslim should be. And they thought he had a mental problem and they took him to a hospital. And that was how, if I should say, Mubarak came to the knowledge, not only of ourselves here in the Gibnis community, but also uh, around the world. And um, um, luckily he was out of the hospital and he's been very active um, and vocal uh, with his views and ideas in terms of um, how uh, the damage Muslim Islamic extremism has done to that region and to the country. And in terms of what he thinks could be the way forward uh, in terms of growth and development of the region and the world. So um, I will say that a um, um, few days to his arrest, I, I was informed that he was receiving death threats. So I rang him up and uh, I asked him, what do we do about this? Should we report to the police? He told me not to report to the police, that going to the police would escalate the matter. And um, he said that the matter would fizzle out on its own. And he now told me also about some previous death threats he had received um, from a military officer and also from a police officer. And I made him understand that this, um, these threats were not really a good sign and that there was need for him to take measures to protect himself. And he also dismissed it with a wave of hand. He just told me, look, I know what to tell them if they send me their threats. I try to say certain things that will allow them not to send those death threats again. So um, about uh, the, two or three days later, they now informed me that he had been arrested and as some plainclothes uh, detectives came to his residence and took him away and took him to a, a police station. Um, I, we sent people there who saw him. And the next day we sent people back there who also saw him and uh, sent him some food items. Um, then um, they told me that they were taking him to Kano. And you know, when I was discussing with Mubarak, he made me understand that those who were sending him death threats were in Kano and that he was in Kaduna. So he was a, a little far from where they were. So he made me understand that um, nothing would happen to him. So we were very worried and we wanted to make sure that the police did not take him to Kano. So we called the police headquarters. We also called the police. I called with the police commissioner in Kano. I made him understand that it wasn't the best decision to bring him to Kano they should take him to a neutral place and continue their work. 
But the police commissioner was angry and furious. Um, he said that they were waiting for Mubarak and that he was posting uh, blasphemous uh, information on Facebook and all that. So I was not really happy with the position of the police officer because apparently he was biased and he seemed to have taken the side of those who wrote the petition instead of taking the side of a state police officer who should be impartial or at least seem to be impartial in carrying out his investigation. So um, since uh, um, Mubarak was taken out of uh, Kaduna, we have not been able to make contact with him. We have sent lawyers to, to see if they could meet with him in wherever he was kept. But they have blocked our efforts to get the lawyer to see him. And, um, and that, has been, that has been that. And I have uh, called the police commissioner, I have called the pub police public relations officer, just imploring them, just allow Mubarak to see a lawyer. We want to know that he's okay, he's detained. And you can go ahead with your investigation or charge his case to court. So, but the police has resisted. They have blocked all our efforts to make sure that um, Mubarak gets to see his lawyer and we get to know the nature and, under, and the condition under which he's detained. What is the law like in Nigeria when it comes to something like this? Is, uh, are there blasphemy laws or freedom of expression protected in Nigeria? Um, and what's the difference between what's on the books um, and you know, when it comes to uh, the law and what actually happens in practice? Well, we have a, our constitution, you know, specifies that people have their right to freedom of religion and belief in freedom of, uh, and, and um, freedom of expression. Okay. And, um, and also we, we have a section in our law that they call it the section that you can use to prosecute blasphemy, which, uh, which um, um, a kind of provide, uh, makes a provision that people who insult anyone's religion, okay? Um, yeah, could be, is liable or could be prosecuted, yeah. But the question there is that in practice, um, we rarely see people like that taken to court. Um, mm. Whatever we see is that sometimes they're taken to a Sharia court where mm. blasphemy is a different uh, thing altogether because in Nigeria we have what we call, we call, what we call the state laws or the state penal code. We also have the Sharia penal code. And sometimes it's led for those prosecuting people to decide where to take their cases to. And if it is a Muslim in, um, in Sharia implementing state, they're likely to take the person to a Sharia court. And, but the situation in Kano is a bit complex and uh, difficult because um, Sharia is enforced in, uh, in Kano and in the petition written to the police, they, made this, they specified there that um, Mubarak was born a Muslim. He was born a Muslim. And then the notion there is that um, we, we, are, we understand that the notion is we are born a Muslim, you are always a Muslim. Because if mm. you leave, that's apostasy, which is a crime. So it is still not clear where, if the case is charged, where is going to be charged? Is it going to be charged at the Sharia court in Kano? Or is she going to be charged at the state court in Kano. Yeah, I'm sure this sounds a little bit um, difficult to understand. But so we have courts, you know, in Kano that can prosecute blasphemy, but uh, with different outcomes, pre imprisonment and death sentence. So we really don't know where and if uh, Mubarak will be charged. Wait, did you just say death sentence? Mm -hmm. Yes, in a Sharia court, uh, the, the punishment for blasphemy is, uh, is death sentence. Yeah. But is that and, possible in Nigeria? Yes, it is, because we have actually, Kano has actually a case some years ago where this one is not an ex-Muslim, but this is um, a Muslim, uh, Muslims that belong to a particular sect. And they said that their holy man uh, was uh, greater than Muhammad. So they said that it was blasphemous and they took them to a Sharia court in Kano and sentenced them to death. Whether they have executed them by now, we don't know. So... Uh, punishment by execution by, uh, is possible in Kano under Sharia law. But only if you were a Muslim before or from the Muslim community, right? Yes. What we are, yeah, what we are saying here now is that the petition written to the police made it clear that uh, Mubarak was born a Muslim. Right, right. So if they, will they interpret it and take him to Sharia court, we don't know. Will they take him is, to state court, we don't know. 
Is it normal in Nigeria for the police to deny you a lawyer? Well, it is. The police in Nigeria, they don't do it as an institution. They do it sometimes in collaboration with politicians. Yeah, mm. because uh, as an institution, they shouldn't do that because that is not what is allowed. They should charge the case to court. I understand, I'm not a lawyer, but I understand about 48 hours maximum, you know, they should charge your case to court. So, but when it is, when there is a lot of political resonance to the arrest of people, there's a tendency for them to deny or detain you no matter what the court says, no matter what the law says. So, and I think that the case of Mubarak is going towards that direction. Um, and, and that is why there's a need to put pressure on not just the police authorities, but the political authorities, the governor of Kano State, the president of Nigeria, because they have a hand in this kind of detention because it is not beyond the powers of the police because they can't detain, uh, they can't put him in detention there for 48 hours, beyond 48 hours without charging him to court. What's the most, other than the people, other than the people that signed the petition and the popular demand for him to get arrested, what's the motivation for the politicians and the police to arrest this person and deny him a lawyer? Is there are they appealing to a base or something like what's their motivation do you think you said it they are appealing to the islamic base now mm -hmm. they in the north of nigeria the islamic base calls the shot whether they, they do it as a mob or they do it as established islamic uh, uh, base authorities so and then um, i want to let you know that we had um we had, uh, one of our former presidents, um, during when he was active, he said that you cannot oppose Islam and succeed politically in the North. No. So if you really want to succeed politically, you have to appeal to that base. And sometimes, what does that base want? They want to stifle freedom of speech. They want to suppress freedom of thought, free thinkers. They want to suppress freedom of association for those who are non-Muslims, or those who are doing anything they think that threaten the Islamic base. So that is, that, is the, uh, that is the reason, and that could be the reason why we are seeing the political aspect of uh, Mubarak Sares mixing up with the Islamic aspect. And how could you compete with such pressure? Because we're saying like, oh, we need to pressure the politicians and the police, but aren't they, also getting a lot of pressure from the Islamic side, like how could we tip the balance um, of, you know, the pressure that- Well, well the, the thing is that, the thing is that, look, in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation like this, there's a tendency to resign and say, yo, look, we are up and against people we cannot uh, either challenge or we cannot counteract or we really cannot put up any kind of uh, reasonable resistance. Is one, is one way to do it. Another way to do it is um, um, just put up, do the much we can, and see mm -hmm. what the results comes. And so what is if that? you ask me, mm -hmm. if you ask sure. me, I think that um, giving up in the, in the face of what appears to be enormous resistance is not, it's never an answer. It's not, it's not mm -hmm. even something we should think about now. Right. But no, trying I to put up, a, yeah. Sorry, I wasn't yeah. just saying that we should give up. I was just asking what, what can we do to tip the balance? Given yes, that I'm re I really want to get to that. I'm not saying okay. that, yeah, there's a yeah. tendency that people have advised or right. told us here that uh, there was nothing we we're going to do right. and that um, all, our, all our efforts will come to nothing. Hmm. But um, I know that um, changes, they come sometimes when we have occasions like this. And um, I know also that um, the people in the North are not, ex they are not existing in a vacuum. They are mm. also connected with other networks around the world. For instance, I'm talking to you now, Kano State and some of the Sharia implementing states are recording high number of what they call mysterious deaths. Yes, as a result of coronavirus. And the assistance they're going to get now are going to come from outside. There are assistance that will be provided by governments and are provided by assistance from other regions. So they are not existing as islands. They also have some relation with other parts of Nigeria and other parts of the country. And we need to make them understand that 
in the spirit said in the case of Mubarak, and we, we have to do whatever we can to release him. Right. Um, and okay, but what are some suggestions on what we can do? Well, we can do a lot. First of all, we have to keep this. We have to use all all the media platforms to highlight these cases because you know what. Okay, so Sir. we have to use all we can to mm. put this case out there and let the mm. world understand what is going on. Because knowledge, they say, is power. So because people have little knowledge of what's going on in these places, sometimes they think that there is very little they can do. Many of these places, they have the UN, U UN have offices and projects. The World Bank has offices and projects. The World Food Program, they have offices and projects. UNICEF has offices and projects going on in these places. And it is important we use all this mechanism to send a strong message to the government in Kano and all the interest groups that have interest in silencing and eliminating Mubarak to understand that they cannot do this mm -hmm. and also claim to be part of the network of, uh, of political regional network, international network that we have in the world today. Mm. Again, it is important also for us to understand that in that region, Nigeria, West Africa, Africa and the world, they are fighting one of the most vicious Islamist militant group in the world, and that's Boko Haram. And it is important we begin to ask ourselves, why is it that Boko Haram has a foothold or a stronghold in this region? Boko Haram has killed so many people. Boko Haram has kidnapped so many people. And, but the world appears not to, uh, you know, to, to be, uh, the world appears not to know what to do to really root out the problem. This might be an opportunity for us to begin to understand why in, when you come to Nigeria, this is where Boko Haram has its foothold. So it is important we also link this up to this problem of Boko Haram militancy, a religious extremism that is actually not just affecting Nigeria, but also affecting the whole world. So it is political, it is human rights, it is diplomatic, it is educational, it is it's something that affects all. And it is important that we use all these different avenues to highlight this problem and provide a robust response to it. So, so if somebody is like listening right now and they said, okay, what can I do? Let's say somebody listening in the UK or in Canada yeah. or in France, uh, okay. where, would you, where would you send them and what would you ask them to do? Well, it depends on what you can do, okay? If you can raise money, raise money and send to the Humanist International or Atheist Alliance and all the fundraising, we have about two, three fundraising programs going on because we also need we, we also need some funding uh, uh, to make sure that the defense goes on the legal defense we don't know how long that's going to be mm. now if you also have access you, to internet you can you can also send petition to the government of nigeria to the minister of justice to the governor of kano because all of them they have they, they, they are they are aware of what is going on and they have a hand in what is going on if you also have access, they say, to websites and uh, you have places, um, you, have inform you have a website or blog site, you can draw the attention of your people who visit your site to what is going on in Nigeria. Because you know what? What is going on has so many dimensions that the more we understand it, 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 it uh, the more it also gives us insight into some of the fundamental problems that is affecting us in terms of what they call Islamic uh, terrorism or extremism um, and the poverty in the world. And also the role religion is playing in fueling extremist thinking and thought, indoctrination in all places. So what I'm saying that wherever you are, whatever you can do, if you have access to the internet, please put this information there. If you can send an email, send an email to any, the, the, the ambassador, Nigerian ambassador and say, hey, what is going on in your country? and all that. So if you can email the governor of Kano State, please do that. The Nigerian police, please do that. Because the more we put this thing out there, the more they begin to understand that 
you know, the Mubarak Bala that they want to eliminate, they cannot just silence him that way. And the world will call them to account. The world will ask after him. And they will owe us an explanation as to what happened to him. Exactly. I think, um, by the way, we're going to include all the information about the petitions, the fundraisers, how to call the police or your local embassy, um, social media campaigns that Humanist, Humanist International is doing and International Association of Atheists. We're going to provide all that information in the description. So if you're watching this, please, please, please check that out. Sign that petition. Um, I think it was really important what you said. Armin and I were talking about this um, a while ago and Armin said like, this needs to backfire on Nigeria. This needs to embarrass them. Um, yeah, and they need to be held accountable for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, the, the, the thing is that um, there is a lot of impunity when it comes mm -hmm. to whatever they call, uh, uh, whatever, however they define blasphemy because um, look at Susan, and uh, I mean, I still don't understand what blasphemy is because the police commissioner asked me, ah, do you know that he, 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 he committed blasphemy? I said, I don't know what blasphemy is. You can define it for me, you know? Mm -hmm. So I really don't know what they call blasphemy. I don't know what they mean insulting a religion because from my understanding, I worked with uh, the Catholic uh, uh, church, you know, before I became an atheist and all that. And I know that what you do in the churches and mosques is actually blasphemy. But when you blaspheme against other religions, I mean, you call it preaching, you call it sermon, mm. okay? And all that. So, so that is it. So they need to tell me, I want them to come and tell me what blasphemy is. People mm. who came here to missionize in Nigeria, Islam came from outside. Those who introduced Islam to Nigeria condemned the religion of the mm. people. They even killed locals. They call it jihad. So they cannot get away with this. We have freedom of religion and freedom of expression. So this is our own turn to say what we think about this religion. They cannot stop it. This was the right they exercised in bringing the religion. Now this is the right we need to exercise in living with that religion. Mm. Yeah, that's the point I always make. Blasphemy, if you, if you want to apply any sort of blasphemy laws, the Quran would be illegal because it blasphemes against other religions. The Bible would be illegal the Old Testament, the New Testament, almost every religious scripture will become illegal because it, it does include blaspheming against other religions. So I don't know how they're going to apply. It seems like when they, when they want to go after blasphemers, it's just us atheists who are, they're talking about, not about other religions. Yes, actually in Nigeria, we have had cases, not just uh, against atheists, but also against um, Christians. And um, oh. we also seen against Muslims. Okay, oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. So I think that I think that uh, um, it's all about who is who is that, who is making the accusation of blasphemy and against oh. whom. Good. And is a person capable of drawing the establishment, state establishment, to his side? Immediately you can draw the establishment to his side. Immediately you 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 find enough uh, mob, Islamic mob as a base to appeal to, then you can come up with blasphemy cases. And now you go after the person, even if the person identifies as a Muslim, but who has a different interpretation of the Quran or a different interpretation of the Hadith. So mm. they go after that person. And the next thing the person is, uh, will be facing accusation and punishment. So, is that common in Nigeria for people to do this? Use yeah, it's common. Yeah, it's common for people to make accusations of blasphemy, but not all of them eventually get this kind of, um, uh, how to call it, publicity, or is, is this sensitive, like the case of Mubarak. Let me tell you the case. The, the Mubarak, Mubarak's case is, is, um, is, is not just that people are angry that he renounced Islam, which is for them enough crime to leave Islam. But he also was vocal. The, yes. For them, even if you leave Islam, you should keep quiet. You shouldn't be talking. Mm. Now, even if you are talking, don't be talking about Islam. Because already by leaving Islam for them, you have lost the authority to talk about Islam. But mm. now, having grown up as a Muslim, left Islam, now he was also now speaking about Islam. That is what they find annoying because he knows the, the religion very well and he knows what to say and how to appeal to the people. So this is the way is the Islamic base here, is trying to shield itself from criticism, robust criticism. 
Now, for me, coming as an ex-Christian, or if, I'm, if, I'm, if I speak, they say, oh, you don't understand. They can dismiss you based on that. But they find it difficult to dismiss the thoughts, expressions, and statements from Mubarak because he is informed. He knows what he is saying, if I should put it that way. And this is what is the problem. They are afraid of knowledge. They are afraid of knowledgeable people speaking out to them. They want to eliminate them because they want to keep people perpetually in ignorance. What I also think is missing for atheists is the amount of protection that the Christians and Muslims enjoy. So, for example, if, you, if a Christian gets accused of blasphemy by Muslims, you might be worried about the Muslim mob, but you also have the Christian mob defend on, behind you. And yeah. the Muslims also have the Muslim mob behind them if the Christian mob will come after them to accuse them of blasphemy. The problem yeah. with atheists is that they do not... Unfortunately, atheists do not stand for each other the way that Christians and Muslims do. And I think that's what we need to change. We, they need, there needs to be a sense of um, community in a way that an, an atheist could rely on a whole bunch of people rising up to defend them if they're being arrested Ooh. or attacked for blasphemy. Like, this is something that, um, I mean, I criticize Christians and Muslims all the time, but I think this is something that we, we, we could learn from them because this is something that they have managed to do and we haven't yet. Atheists are not there for each other the way that Christians and Muslims are. And I mean, that's yeah. the importance of having conversations like this and having organizations work internationally with each other. It's key. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a very, a very good point. But uh, I, I want you to understand that we have organizational challenges. Um, the Christians have this way they organize themselves and um, raise their money. And um, they, they pay people whose work is to go after their, in quotes, enemies oppose, opposing them. Uh, like the clerics, the clerics actually, they virtually do nothing, you know, mm. except castigating anybody uh, who says anything, maybe contrary to religion or something, blackmailing and doing all sorts of things, inciting hatred and violence against um, opposition or opposing views, okay? Now, we don't have much of that. We don't have a lot of paid staffs whose work is to look out for anybody saying anything we are in the world and go after them. So, and of course, what I'm trying to say here is that we have organizational challenges, and that is why here in Nigeria, we are still a minority organization. There are just a few of us out of the closet. And um, mm. many people are not out of the closet because of the fear. Nobody wants, many people don't want to go through what Mubarak is going through now. Mm. Okay, good. So, and you need to really be out of the closet before you can get effectively organized. You can't if get effectively organized while being on the ground, while hiding, using fake identity, not allowed to register, not allowed to hold bank account, having sometimes you are, your accounts being monitored. Like now, we, 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 are, we are told that uh, the, the police, they're investigating the network of atheists. It's not just um, uh, Mubarak, but the network of atheists and humanists in the country. So they're going what? after us, and some of us are really afraid. Yeah. Yeah, Leo sent I mean, me a lot of information about people are threatening to create a list and round up and out people in mass. Atheists and humanists? Yes. What? Okay, this is insane. Okay. So, um, and what's okay? What is like? What is the state of like atheist uh, communities and um, you know attitudes that people have towards atheism in Nigeria right now? And how how has that changed in the past couple of years? Oh well, the, the thing is that uh, uh, by the time I started organizing, um, there was a challenge. Don't call it atheist because when you see, there's a lot of stigma. Okay, mm -hmm. now if you want to organize, sometimes you have to listen to the people. You have to in quote listen to your base. Let me say that. Okay, mm -hmm. and they'll tell you don't call it. Okay, it's unstable now. We can hear Are you me. hearing me? Yeah, we hear. You. I hear you. Okay, good. So they will tell you they will tell you, don't call it atheist. That many people will not. The people telling you this are atheists themselves, okay? Right. But they will tell you, don't call the organization atheists because of the baggage, the stigma that goes with atheism, okay? So we started as humanists, the humanist movement, okay? Mm. And of course, incidentally, a lot of people came around 
thinking that we are just this human kind, caring kind of people. And sometimes they also want to pray. And you tell them, please, you don't pray. They say, ah, are you people atheists? So there's a lot of confusion here. And um, <laughs> people have been going through some kind of um, education. And uh, in fact, it happened to a point when I visited one of, one of our members. He was attending our program for a very long, lo after some time, he stopped coming. So I went to see him. So when he saw me, he just told me, look, uh, my girlfriend or the fiancé then was like, that the fiancé told him, look, come out, come out from this organization. Those people are atheists. Okay? So, you know, there's this feeling that, okay, humanists are not atheists and all that. So we had this, com we had this way of organizing initially. Now, amongst ourselves, as we were growing, there were some people that said, hey, we are atheists and let's call ourselves by that name. So they registered an atheist society of Nigeria, which is, which is one of the registered organizations we have now. And we now have the Humanist Association. So I think that the people are getting more open to atheism over the years, as many of them begin to realize that, oh, that my friend is an atheist. That my friend talks like an atheist. And all that. So a lot of people are beginning to understand that we actually, we actually all over the place. We are just looking for an opportunity, a more relaxed and friendly opportunity for us to emerge and begin to really say our minds, okay? That even right. sometimes many of our members identify as Christians because they think that that will bring less query, less question, less investigation on them and all that. So the attitude is changing, but it is really difficult. It's easier in the Christian dominated areas than in the Muslim dominated areas, as the case of Mubarak has illustrated. At the same time, so Mubarak is not just an individual atheist, it's a phenomenon, because he is trying to send this message like that, look, people are free, even if you are born into a Muslim family, you can leave. So we are, we are using a test case, a case that highlights the changing attitude and also the vicious nature of opposition mm. from the Islamic base to, to you know, uh, the idea of living Islam and also speaking freely about religion in Islamic context. Right. Yeah. And, I and have this... a quick question. Go ahead. Um, so I have the understanding that it took the Humanist Association of Nigeria 17 years to receive formal government recognition. So how has things changed in those 17 years? Yes, well, the 70 years is all about the time we, we, we set out to apply for registration and tell people, okay, we want to register. And usually we don't used to get any feedback. You know, you, when you apply, you're supposed to get a, a feedback from the authorities. They would just mm -hmm. ignore us. Yes, you know, and all that. And, you know, I was organizing, I was mobilizing. I was also trying not to allow the government to clamp down on the organization before we got a critical number that could resist and all that. So I will make the application. If, we don't, if I don't get any feedback, I will just relax because I didn't really want to stir up the situation so much so that they will say, okay, you are, uh, you are, you are proscribed or you are, you are not allowed to register again. Mm. So what we were doing was like reaching out, growing the base of free thought, growing the base of humanism. So that was why, at a point, we now had about three or four applications before the government. I said, okay, if you can't register one, can you register two? If you can't register two, can you register three? So we built enough base that it got to a point, the government had no other choice but to register us, and we now got through with the uh, Humanist Association of Nigeria and the Atheist Society of Nigeria, and that's where these are the registered organizations we have now. I think there are also a few others who got registered around that period, but these are the main national organizations we have. And, so and the, it has changed slowly, yeah. And Mubarak was in which one? Now, Mubarak, when Mubarak um, um, had a case in, in 2014, mm. I don't think he was identified with any other group. He was just acting on his own, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. Good, so we now reached out to him you know, during that crisis. And that was how he came to join and, be, and become part of the humanist atheist organization. Because we saw him like a hero. We saw him like a courageous person. We saw him like um, a brand name. We saw him like, yeah, you have done us proud. You did it, you know? So we were happy with him. 
Even Aww. though, yeah, he went through a lot. So, in fact, all of us are trying to claim him, the humanists, the ethics, the free thinkers, oh, come <laughs> and join us. Come and be part of us. Yeah, yeah, because we have not seen anything like that before. Okay? Oh. And this is not going down well to the base, the Islamic base, the mobs, and those who think that they, can't, they will keep holding people hostage forever and all that. So, so if you ask me, Mubarak was like, I don't know how to, a celebrity for us. All of us want to associate with him, attend the program with him and all that. The first time I met him in person, I was so excited and all that. So if you ask me, he belongs to all the groups, atheists, humanists, skeptics. And you know what? Ask him, he will tell you, yes, he attends one. Even transhumanists, I went to a transhumanist meeting. I saw Mubarak there. So mm. this guy is a guy who is curious, who is so intellectually oriented, who <laughs> wants to know, who wants to you know, reach out and do whatever he can to spread the ideas of free thinking and critical thought. Um, I wonder if it's possible to find any Muslims that you would be able to interview that would, that would come out and publicly say, that this is not right, I'm a Muslim, or we can accept criticism, we could accept hearing other people's opinions, and making, and giving, like, making Muslims like that a voice uh, that maybe other Muslims could be like, okay, yeah, I, I, I you know, that's, uh, that resonates with me, my faith is not weak, if, if, if my religion is true, why should we be, af we be afraid of attack? Like some, some kind of message, like maybe some atheists could find some Muslims that will be like, listen, we're, we're, we could be friendly opposition <laughs> instead, of, instead of hateful opposition. Is that, is that something you guys looked at, maybe consider to like highlight Muslims that are not so angry or, you know, could accept some... Criticism. Yeah, we we've been trying we've been trying to uh, reach out to such people, mm. but you know what? What? There's a problem. Fear, <laughs> fear, mm. and fear. I don't know how how many times I can say this, and I don't know how loud I can say it. Now, people are afraid of the mob. People are afraid of those they. The, the base that brought the petition mm. because they could go after you. Now, let me give you an example. The Amnesty International issued a statement. Yeah, I was and, just looking uh, at that a couple of the hours Amnesty International ago. issued a, a statement um, initially drawing attention to the case of Mubarak. Mm. Okay? And shortly after that, Somebody called me from Amnesty International office that they have been receiving death threats. Amnesty International is not an individual. Amnesty International is not a Muslim organization, okay? But, you know, they are still receiving death threats. You know what? There are some of them Muslims like that, I must tell you. But they are trying to protect their head. Yes. They want to remain alive. Because anybody that tries to support um, uh, Mubarak or try to say, hey, Mubarak did not do something wrong. You can do a search on the internet and find out we have millions of Muslims in Nigeria. Not even one person, not even one, has come out openly to say Mubarak did not commit any crime from my own mm. understanding of, of Islam. On Facebook pages where people can hide behind IDs and all that, we have seen a few people make such comments. Mm. But what about Leaders, clerics, there are thousands and thousands of Muslim clerics across Nigeria. Not even one person has spoken hmm. out in support of Mubarak. Wow. We have organizations, even some of them call them Muslim rights and human rights organizations. Not even one, not even one ulama has come out and said, not even one imam. You know what happens? They know the consequences. Hmm. If they do it, that is the end of your ulama ship. That is the end of your imamship. That is the end of your clerkship. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's, it's, afraid. It's, it's very, very interesting that you say that because a lot of times when you point out how um, Islam could be so hostile towards people like Mubarak, um, a lot of Muslims, uh, Muslim leaders come and say like, oh, well, that's just some Muslims. Every community has, their, has its own problematic 
members we don't endorse that kind of behavior but when it matters like now they won't come out and publicly condemn something like that so they they keep trying to act like this is a small fringe group in their in the muslim community but it, it's times like this when we realize like no this is actually widespread and the leaders themselves are part of the problem yes yes it's the same thing here you see sometimes when you make statement like now um, in my articles and blogs, I use Muslims now, and nobody gets back to me and say, ah, yeah, but we are not, because I've been trying to prod them to tell me that, okay, I'm a Muslim, I'm not part of it. So in my articles and blogs, I said, ah, but Muslims in Nigeria need to understand, Muslims should stop. Nobody comes and says a rejoinder. You get it? I said, oh, no, 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 because I'm planning, I'm, I'm writing, trying to, you know, use that kind of generalization to see if there are people that could say yes. We are an exception, but nobody. I have even written a blog. I said, religious organizations, why are you keeping quiet? Are you supporting the petition? Are you on the same position with the petitioner? Nobody has replied me. You get what I'm saying? So this is exactly. Yeah, I was, I was <laughs> yeah. reading um, one of your blogs that you wrote for Sahara Reporters, and you were saying that there aren't even any Christian leaders who are speaking out of, on behalf of yes. Mubarak. Wow. Yes. Yes. Okay. There aren't. You get it. There aren't Christian leaders who are speaking out, you know, and all that. There aren't people, moderate Muslims, who are speaking out. I was actually a kind of prodding them. I was trying to, you know, move, nudge them to, to say something. Because not tomorrow, when I start writing, you say, ah, yeah, but you are doing a blanket, uh, you know, argument and you are putting everybody in one box. You can see now that they are all in one box, in the box of the petitioner. And I have told them, if you are not in that box, can you come out? Nobody is mm. coming out. Mm. Yeah. So that is it. Well, wow. that is it. So, actually, can you now, now that Susanna mentioned your blog, can you actually tell us a little bit about your own work and your activism? Okay. Well, um, uh, I started uh, the humanist movement. I was in the in 1996. You know, shortly after leaving the Catholic seminary, because originally I was training to be a Catholic priest. Uh, I know. I really want to uh, talk to you about that, but like we only have so much time. We need to have you back. Yeah. Okay, okay, no problem. I'm always happy to do that. Yeah, so, so um, I started the humanist movement because of what I saw, my experiences growing up, and how religion is shielding some of those things. And when you try to question them, they try to intimidate you or shut you down, okay? And at the same time, they also want you to be very rational on some other matters and all that. So I just saw there's a crisis and confusion within the religious universe, and I was not happy with that. So I started the humanist movement, first of all, as a base to help me say my mind free, speak freely, just like Mubarak is doing today, and, um, and to reach out to people of like minds. So, um, so I started with issues like what I call the ritual killing, because I grew up in a village where people sometimes have their parts missing or cut off by those who believe that they could make money or wealth using those human body parts. And uh, sometimes old people are beaten up or starved or abandoned because some people think that they are magically responsible for their misfortune, accidents or death or divorce and all that. So as I was growing up, I was questioning all this. And I felt that the humanist and the skeptical platform provided me with a um, very important basis or platforms to really speak out against this and uh, really help people. So. Um, this, this has been my, my activism has been channeled towards what I call superstition or religion-based abuses. Yes, because I believe that um, uh, some of those abuses that are drawing our, my society back, they are darkening and destroying so many aspects of the society, and there's a need to bring in the rational light. Just like for me, what Mubarak is doing is just trying to light a candle in northern Nigeria. And that candle will come from reason, it will come from freedom, independent thought. And that you are thinking independently doesn't mean you cannot make mistakes. It means that you can make that you can express those mistaken views. Those mistaken views should be challenged, questioned, and you grow and all that. So I felt that there's a need for a platform where people can freely exercise their thought, especially towards those practices that have held my society down. So this was my mission. And at the beginning, and um, I was fortunate, less because a lot of people thought I would be killed. I would have been killed by now. Some people thought I would be in jail. 
Some people thought I would have died of hunger because there will be no money. No, who will donate money to me? I don't have a church. I don't have a mosque. And I don't have a government that will pay me. Government officers are believers in all this nonsense. You know, and they, they, they want me to be out of job, out of income, and all that. So people, a, a lot of people never gave me, even in my own family, my brothers, they never thought that I would still be doing this up to now. They thought I would have maybe expired and things like that because they knew it is overwhelming. It's just like what Mubarak is trying to do in the North. How can one individual take up the Islamic base in the North? For me, it's stupid. And there are a lot of people that keep saying it. So a lot of people thought that I was going against the current. But I knew that this is a porous current. This is a current that is faulty. Okay, this is a current that is mistaken and misguided. And it is important I leave a message. Even if I don't change the direction of this current, I will leave a message that I lived here and I told them at some point that they are a current taking the society in the wrong direction and there's a need for them to change direction. So mm. this has been my activism. So I have taken up these items like the witchcraft allegations because oh. I mean, yeah, come again. Yeah. No, the witchcraft I mean, allegation. This? Yeah, if you want to touch, uh, okay, finish your thought. But then after that, let's then let's go to the witchcraft allegations because that's yeah, yeah, really yeah, yeah, yes, I, yes, I noticed that the way you're moving, that I need to move, to zoom into the allegations. So that's why I moved. <laughs> right. to so yeah, just move like that so that you could tell me because I sometimes I get off track. Eh? So no, no, that's um, yeah, yeah. So so now uh, let's talk on the witchcraft allegation. Um, uh, it was, it was a practice that was not just going on in my community. As I was going on, before I was going on in other parts of Nigeria, other parts of Africa, even other parts of the world, like in India and Nepal and all that. All that. So, mm -hmm. and it's like, hey, what's going on here? You know, and all that. So, and um, I've been trying to use the humanist base to address and tackle this. Now, let's fast forward, because I'm talking about what happens in the 90s. Let's fast forward now. Uh, eventually, I got um, um, a scholarship opportunity to do a doctorate program at the University of Bayreuth, and my topic was witchcraft um, allegations. So, I six years I was looking at the literature, trying to understand what the scholars do and all that. And I must tell you, yeah, uh, it wasn't so much very useful. Yeah, I, I, I hope that my university will not hear this, uh, but because you know I was reading about something I was very familiar with. Okay. Yes, mm. the, only that maybe concepts have been introduced here and there to frame those things, but I was very familiar with it. I went mm. to feed, do my field work in Ghana, where they have what they call witch camps, and the stories of the women, I was familiar with those stories. So I'm not going to be a stranger like a Western anthropologist who will go to a place in Africa and say, hey, I've never seen anything like this before. No, I have seen a lot like that before, and I'm still saying. So um, after that, I came back, and when I came back, I've been asking myself, what do you do? How do you channel this knowledge and experience? So, but for, for people I, that don't know what you're referring to, what is it? What is it that you saw? Like because a lot of people don't know about these witchcraft accusations. And... Yeah, you come again. I just said like before. You can you tell us what is it that you saw that other people haven't seen? Because a lot of people don't even know what these witchcraft allegations are even are. Like a lot of people haven't even heard of them. So. Well, if I get you correctly, I, I, I was just trying to rush to make sure I don't bore you so much with uh, my research experience and university experience. So that's really why I'm, I'm, I'm like speaking a bit fast. So No, no, uh, no, you're, you're doing great. You're doing great. This is all very interesting. I, I was just worried about some people that, who are, might be listening don't even know what's happening in like some African countries with regards to the witchcraft allegations. They, they haven't even heard of them. Like, can you tell us like, what is, what are they? Like, what is okay. the... Okay, all right, all right. In Ghana, in Ghana, they have what they call witch camps, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, what are these places? These, these are places where, where you're accused, because if you're accused, um, he, people always expect you to leave. Immediately, they tell you, look, you are the one responsible for death and the destruction in this family. You have to leave. Mm. Now, if you refuse to leave, you could be killed. So what happens is that some people, when they're accused, what they do, they pack their things, they, took their, they take their belongings and go to a particular shrine that protects people. And this shrine is believed has the power to overcome whatever magical power you have. Now, that shrine now became refugee points, mm. okay? Refu places where people take refuge. And over the years, they grew because people keep running to those places because when you are there, nobody will come to harm you. That is it. So this, 
somehow became a containing mechanism for the for the people. So most times, people who are accused, they don't. Oh, oh you're getting cut. Okay, Larry, we're losing you. So, oh, these are Leo? the places I went. Leo, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah. Oh, we're getting into interesting parts. Yeah. Oh. Can I, can I, yeah. Are you there? We can yeah. hear you now. Okay. Can you repeat that, please? Ooh. Lost you again. No, we can hear you, but it's very choppy. How... No. So, so if it keeps, if, if it continues being choppy, let's uh, let's just have you back on to talk about witchcraft and wizardry in Nigeria and your projects because right now it's just getting chup chuppy maybe let's give it another chance yeah let's just wait a second it's chuppy okay yeah, let's just wait a second okay mm well the, the thing is i'm not going to edit any of this out yeah. That's good. <laughs> so, because that will take it longer. Okay. Okay, it sounds a little bit better now. A little bit better. Maybe try. Yeah. I'm actually glad oh, no. that we. Oh, we completely lost them. I'm glad actually that we got all the Mubarak stuff out of the way so that yeah. that was the important part that we managed to. Good thing that we moved that to the beginning because that's what, oh, oh Leo's back. Do we have Leo? Okay. Can oh, you oh you're back. Can Yay. you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So um, I think a good place to pick up would be um, if you could describe a little bit of the ritual of it. So I was studying your work and my understanding is that a lot of these accusations are usually based on dreams and then it involves yeah. going to a priest soothsayer yeah. who's always drunk mm -hmm. on a local gin mm -hmm. and then there's yeah. three three types of tests that they do. Yeah. So yeah. could you describe that a little bit? Um, yes. Uh, accusations, like you said, these are where people make sense of their misfortune. Mm -hmm. when people are sick and uh, they they try to come up with these allegations to make sense of it uh very often people are sick and they start dreaming they start they say they're seeing somebody in their dreams and sometimes they say the person is pressing their chest sometimes they say the person is pursuing them in the dream with a machete or threatening them in the dream just like now they use their dream and when they when they when somebody says that they have to go now to um, a soothsayer or a diviner, depending on how you call it. Locally, they know the name. They go for consultation. That's what they call that. So, mm -hmm. and when they go for this consultation, they go with names of those who might be responsible. So, when they put those names, then they will now they will now be they will divine and uh, at the end of the day use their stick and uh, and they will find out the gods according to them. We tell them who is actually the very witch. And the person will now go back home. It's just like when some, they, the place will satisfy the witch. So when the person is satisfied, the person now comes back and now will now tell the person that the person has to uh, leave. So, mm -hmm. but sometimes they will not just tell you to leave. They will tell you that they'll have to take you now for a more, in quote, let me use the word. I don't like using some of this terminology, objective or something with it. You know, because they will go privately for consultation. Now, when they accuse you and you deny, you now go for one that will involve uh, both yourself and the, and, the, and you're accused. You'll go to a shrine. And when you go to a shrine, they might either use a broom, you know, to, to find out whether you are guilty or not, or they, use the, or they use chicken, you know, to find out whether you are guilty or not. 
and all that. And um, and broom, um, like Harry Potter, like how how do they use the broom? Like you're yeah, yeah, well, to... you, you, well, a special Harry Potter. You have to listen to this special African Harry Potter version <laughs> of it. <laughs> so, so what? Yeah. So what they do is that um, the uh, the guy now comes out. He will have um, he will have these two brooms, which they believe there's magical power in it to track a witch. So they will place it, cross it, and uh, uh, they will put it across your neck. Yeah. Like and this. when they I've push it the back, videos. they like yes. When they push it back, and the broom separate, the two brooms separate, it means that you are not a witch. But when they push it back, and the brooms, in quote, in quote, according to them, cannot separate, then you are a witch. Wow. So this is how this is how that one plays out. And that's how, the does, person, how does the yeah. chicken test work? Now the chicken test um, works um, um, when you, you are told to go. You buy chicken or fowl and when you get there they have to cut it you know on the neck and when they cut it on the neck they threw it so it flips you know with the wings as if it's dying you know of course it's dying you know it, it will out of that pain it will just wriggle and struggle on the ground and all that now if it dies facing the um facing the facing the sky there are two ways it may die facing the ground or it, it will die facing the sky so where the how the chicken dies now we decide you know whether you are guilty or innocent yeah wow. so and according to them if it dies facing the sky you're innocent if it's facing the ground you are guilty so and you said is, this um, is supposed to be like an objective court or something yeah, yeah i didn't want to use the word objective yeah. right i told you that i mean this that is I don't like using that word <laughs> and this is this is what they refer to when they're saying objective i remember yeah, so, so 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 for yeah. them, you know, you know, by 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 that I mean that <laughs> I mean that you know, every, it's not open. Everybody has said it, so it's no right. longer I went privately to somebody somewhere to yeah. really tell me this. So so that's the um, so everybody could now say it. It's open. It's public. It's confirmable. In quote. Wow. You know, sorry, I have to use these words. I'm so sorry. I keep apologizing because <laughs> that's not the kind of words you use when you are talking about this nonsense. We understand what you mean, though. <laughs> I, I'm looking at Susanna's notes, and I'm seeing another test here: thrown in a river, a river of crocodiles. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Susanna, thank you so much. Yes. So this one is the crocodile test. Okay. Yeah. And um, uh, I went to the river. Actually, I went to that very river to see for wow. myself and all that. So they say that they, they they used to have a lot of crocodile, you know, in um in that small river many years ago, many, many years ago, and that when people are accused, but that, um, all the people that are accused, they will be thrown into that river and the crocodile will not pick the one who is, 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 uh, is guilty. So if, if, they, if they throw them, either five of them, then the crocodile, the one that is taken away by the crocodile is the, is the one that is uh, guilty. But they say that, I went there, they said that there are no more crocodile in the river. Okay, so the, the, the crocodile there are extinct. So the, this very ritual is no longer functional now, but that's what used to be the case. Maybe somebody who was a witch went and killed all the crocodiles. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so I, I'm actually looking at another thing that is uh, in Susanna's notes. It's a great question here. Great notes, by the way, Susanna. Here's a, there's a question here, Susanna wrote, how does law enforcement fail to prevent these abuses or even allows these abuses to continue? Very yeah, I wanted to ask that question because I was reading a lot about your work, Leo, and a lot about your story, and you have faced a lot of persecution from the police themselves because of how vocal you are. And when that whole Christian congregation came after you. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the thing is that they go after you instead of these people. Yes. He, yes. Yes. The the thing is that um, there is a lot of you quote impunity, impunity, privilege, and religion. There's this intersection there. Okay. Now, as we can see in the in the, in the in, with the case of Mubarak, religious organizations they get away a lot, especially where they are in the majority. Now. What happened with the Christian group happened in Cross River State, and Christianity is the majority language, sorry, uh, religion there, and all that. So, the state authorities are always very careful 
in dealing with or even enforcing the law when the law has to do with religious organizations or institutions. Now, let me tell you the reason, because state law enforcers, some of them are members of this religion. Some of them also believe or have the same position with this religious organization. Mm. So they find it difficult sometimes to enforce the law. Instead of enforcing the law, they enforce their religion. And that's exactly what is going on in Northern Nigeria today. You mm. call a, you call a commissioner of police who is paid by the state law, sorry, state money, money from both uh, Muslims and non-Muslims, he will be speaking as if he's being paid by Saudi Arabia, okay? Mm. Using, using their petrodollar and all that. He's been, he's been, he'd be speaking like an Islamic cleric. You can't see a difference between a state officer and an and, um, and, uh, Islamic or religious cleric. So, so it is always difficult for state officers to go against religious establishment here. Mm -hmm. So that was the challenge we heard because these churches, many of them use um, witchcraft as um, the power base or a, ba a, way, a, a base to mobilize power, fellowship, and business at the same time. So, and uh, many of the state law enforcers do not see this as a, they, they, they think it's, it's easier to come against me and a few of us who are in the minority than to go against uh, maybe an Islamic cleric or a Christian pastor that sometimes represents or speak on behalf uh, the, the, the religious establishment. So there has been that challenge we heard and um, they beat me up and they took away my things and also took me to court. You can see how, 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 how powerful these people are. So, and, uh, but eventually we won the court case, uh, but then they have all been after me, inter on the online, offline, you know, trying to, of course, blackmail you, trying to uh, undermine things you're doing. So, and, um, and uh, recently I, I had a little brush also with another Pentecostal pastor because he came out uh, some about a week ago that, uh, saying that he could heal people with COVID-19. Yeah? Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. I saw, I saw you challenging him on Twitter that you would pay yes, him if yes, he can cure people. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, so, you know, this is how they speak. You know, they, they know they can get away with those things. And that's why they say it. But you know what I'm telling them now? Sorry. You cannot. I'm sorry. I, I'm not, I, I may not have your membership. I may not have the kind of money you have. I may not have your financial and membership base, but at least I have my pain and I have my, oh, I have my laptop. I can, I, I can put out something out there. So I watch this video and look at, look at the COVID-19 problem, the, the, the huge problem it has caused, how many people have died. Now, a fringe pastor in one corner of Nigeria goes on YouTube or whatever, and was pleading to be taken to COVID isolation centers so that he could heal them. For me, I've, I said that if I don't speak out, I'll feel like I didn't, I never existed. I had to tell him, I said, hey, stop this. And I told the authorities, caution him. And people don't listen to him. Prayer has no connection with COVID-19 management. If it has connection, WHO would have told us that in addition to <laughs> social distancing and washing of hands. So he got angry. Yeah, the man got upset and um, he challenged me and said, look, that uh, God was bigger than a virus. So I say, hey, God is bigger than a virus. Okay, I challenge you now, come and cure one, just heal one COVID-19 patient and I'll give you $1,000. Oh, everywhere I was, the internet was, oh, no, everybody was buzzing. People were calling me, I said, hey, why did you challenge him? I said, why wouldn't I challenge him, okay? Another. Nobody's interested in paying attention to the nonsense the guy was spewing and another. They were they were just worried about my challenge in him. So he got back to me that oh that he will send me details of people he had healed. I said that's not what I'm saying. I said come and heal one patient. Don't tell me about the people you have healed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and the members he sent the members after me on Twitter on Facebook. They are also out there you know trying to sell sorts of nasty things and all that. So that is it. So that is the kind of work we are doing. And I think that that's a similar challenge Mubarak is facing in northern Nigeria. But I think that someday, somehow, we will begin to win and make some progress better than we're doing now. Okay. Yeah, I um, have to get to work soon. I'm still working. Okay. But um, okay. 
I think one thing I wanted to ask you kind of as a closer as, um, is I, in studying your work, I noticed that you like to use a lot of skepticism and um, teaching people these critical thinking tools. So I yeah. was wondering what has been your most effective method for promoting free and critical thinking in communities where these beliefs and superstitions are the most common? Ah. <sighs> You know, Susan, this is an interesting question. The, the fact there is that um, I make this up as I go, okay? And I try mm -hmm. to test tools. And sometimes what may work in one case may not work in another case. Um, like now, sometimes I wait for an appointed time. Let me use that word. That sounds religious somehow, appointed time. There's no appointed time. Eh? So, but I try to wait for an opportunity. Like now, when the pastor said he could heal COVID-19 patients. I said, okay, bam, this is opportunity. This is the time to go after faith healers. This is the time to go after faith healing claims. Don't wait for them to discover the vaccine and people could now sell all sorts of things. Now go after them. So sometimes I wait for them to commit, is it faux pas? There's this thing they say in English, mm -hmm. called, no, just a major, the misstep. There's, I wait for a very clear misstep. I now capitalize on it to send a message. Just like now, what the police has done in arresting Mubarak is that kind of thing. Mm. They are going to hear from me as far as I am concerned. And they are going to justify before the whole world how they can put somebody in jail because the person wrote on the internet, ah, uh, let's say, he didn't write that literally, he implied it. Okay, mm. uh, Mohammed is a terrorist. You just say it and somebody kills you? It's a mad society. It's a crazy society. It's a manifestation of social decadence. And any person who tries to justify that is not qualified to be called a human being. Sorry, that's my, that's my, that's my, that's my position. Okay? So I wait for them because you, they, they commit all sorts of little, little things. They keep, like now, they, they, have, they publish posters here. They tell you, oh, come to our meeting. Um, if you are sick, come. If you are lame, if you are blind, come. They keep telling people to come for faith healing and all that. And I'll be waiting for them. So that pastor did that. So what I used to do is I wait for a, a particular opportunity. Like now, last week, there was a man in one community. They drove him out, they beat him up and all that. They say he was stealing the destinies of people. I don't know whether you understand that as a white person. I don't know whether you do. I mean, you understand uh, somebody stealing the destiny of people. You know, no. magically. Yeah. Huh. Wow. That's, that's, yes. I, I've never heard that, but that sounds pretty epic. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> good. That's, a, that's a lot of power. <laughs> good. So that's, now this man was disgraced, beaten up and all that. I have called the police now. I have told them we have to track the man. We have to go to the community. So I use those cases as opportunity to go and pull their ear, pull, pull their ear. Say, look, hey, is enough. Is enough. You people have done this. So right. I try to wait for opportunities like that to send across the message. Now, but I want to tell you also one thing I have discovered recently. Mm -hmm. I've started what I call a critical reasoning project. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to come out with critical reasoning books for Nigerian schools. A lot of people have told me what they used to tell me. Hey, Leo, nobody will buy it. You're a controversial person. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I said, Allow the book to enter the market. Why are you worried? The, book, the books are not in the market already. Now, mm -hmm. I have made it a point of duty. I want them to start teaching critical reasoning from primary to secondary. Okay? Because when you go to the university, when people are adults, when you start taking them, telling them to reason critically, many of them have made up their mind. It's, it's, it's really very tough. Mm -hmm. So now, let, let, me just, let me just tell you briefly before we conclude, and I have to allow you to go. Uh, because I talk a lot sometimes. No, so, I love it. Um, this is so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what I'm saying is that I have reduced critical thinking to this, asking questions, okay? I don't want to bother children of infants of about five years, six years, seven, eight, ten years about evaluation, analysis, logic, blah, blah, blah. No, no. Now, I operationalize it. I, I call it asking questions. So mm -hmm. what... I do the books will reward children for generating questions because the, the underlying factor is that whatever we see, whatever we hear, whatever we touch, we, we, they, they are objects of curiosity. And there should be a subject where people are 
rewarded for expressing their curiosity, asking mm -hmm. questions. Like for instance, who is Mohammed? Where is Mohammed? What mm -hmm. was Mohammed? Who is Mohammed's father? Who is Mohammed's mother? Where did he die? Where is his grave? You know, children should be, uh, there should be a subject where children are rewarded for generating questions. And I'm moving a step further than that to have critical thinking competition, whereby mm -hmm. people who generate highest number of questions will go with a reward. So questioning should no longer be something that people discourage, but people encourage so that children can come back home and show, Daddy, I got this prize because I asked the highest number of questions. This is what I want this year and next year. That's my target. I, I'm going to achieve it. So that's part of my challenges. I just want to ask you very, uh, two, uh, two very short questions, very short questions, yeah. okay? One yeah. is, uh, are you optimistic about the future of atheism, atheists in Nigeria? And the second one is, where can people find you and support your work? Uh, am I optimistic? You see, as an activist, there's a tendency to tell you I'm optimistic. Yeah, mm -hmm. because it's like shooting myself on the leg by saying, oh, I'm not optimistic. Everything will end today. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Oh. Losing wait, Leo. Right my base. No. Wait, wait, me... Leo. So, sorry, can you repeat that? You cut out for a second. Okay. Yeah, you're okay. back. You're back. I'm back, right? Yes. Yes. Am I optimistic? I said. I said. Um, I can never tell you I'm not optimistic because it's like telling you even after this program, shut out. Don't tell anybody because I will not be there again. My work disappears. There's no mm. significance. There's no base. Even my critical thinking project I'm excited about, that is not going to happen. You know that kind of thing? I will not right. tell you that. Okay? Right. Um, I am optimistic. Okay? Mm. Uh, but it is not optimism that doesn't go with caution. It's not mm. optimism that is divorced from reality. Because mm -hmm. since they arrested Mubarak, some people have been saying, oh, but we have been warning him. We have been telling him to shut up. We have been telling him that, 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 that. And, uh, but I understand Mubarak. Mubarak is pained by what is going on in northern Nigeria. He told me that young Muslims were doing ablution and, using the, and drinking the water after doing ablution, telling people there's nothing like coronavirus. Hmm. And he was so much touched by that kind of practice. They would tell them not to go to mosque. They will not go during the day. Midnight, when everybody is sleeping, including the police officers, they will sneak into the mosque to pray and do everything they couldn't do during the day. Hmm. Yeah. So what I'm telling you is that he was touched. He thinks that there should be hope for the society and that if we keep going against this, it's not going to happen. So I'm optimistic. But I know very well that um, the wheel of progress, how do they say it in English? Apes and all that. You know, it goes... It goes this way and that way. It could go front, it could go back behind. In other words, oh. ebb and flow, yeah, good. Ebb and flow, yes. The wheel of progress ebbs and flows, I don't know. So, so it, doesn't, it doesn't really roll constantly going up, forward, and all that. So it could roll back, it could shake, it could stop, and move up a bit. So what I'm saying here is that there is resistance. There has been resistance since 1996 I started this project. Hmm. But I'm still here. We have more members today. I didn't even know about Atheist Republic. Here you are today, you have come on board. So talking to you is an achievement. Look at it. So, and I'm looking forward to talking to more and more ethnic republics in the future. Mm. I'm looking forward to reaching out to other free thought republics that are going to emerge. So if you ask me, speaking to you is like a giant step forward. Because when I started, we were using postal address. It takes three months to receive a, a reply to a letter to the United States in the 90s. Uh, that was what I was using. But today, you are in the you are in Philippines, I guess. Uh, yeah. Suzanne is in the, in the US. I'm here in Nigeria. And we are speaking as if we're just uh, across the table. You know, we're just around the table speaking. So if you don't know what optimism is, what, we are, what, what is happening today is optimism practicalized, optimism enforced. So I am so encouraged. I, if, even though we are really in a deep mess with regard to the police and Mubarak, but let me tell you, today we have the power to mobilize the world in less than 24 hours. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if they will keep appealing to that narrow fanatical base that keep embarrassing the whole world. But what we are saying appeals to wider audience, to people in various continents and who are coming to our support and said, right on. 
So based on that, I want to tell you I am optimistic. I'm optimistic that free thought, free thought, critical thinking, human rights, yes, they will eventually outshine, they will overwhelm fanaticism, intolerance, dogmatism, superstition, religious fanatic extremism. I, yes, but it's not going to happen like a miracle because, yeah, mm -hmm. it will through hard work, creativity, alliance, forging alliance with people who understand that we are better off without, without these ills. So I am optimistic about the future. And I want to say that speaking to you is, a, is, is, is the sign, is, is for me, is a translation of that optimism I've had in the past. And I know that I'm going to have opportunities to, not just to speak with you, but speak with other republics. Republics. You know how, what you call your, 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 your station is republics. So I'm happy to speak with other republics and help build this alliance against dogmatism, fanaticism, intolerance, religious totalitarianism that is trying to destroy a continent that has always suffered as a result of other people's uh, mistakes and mistaken ideas and ideologies. Thank you. That was beautiful. That was I know. I feel like I need wow. to go fight the world right now. Um, <laughs> wait, uh, so before we, we close, um, yeah. uh, we have, Leo, for your information, we have groups all over the world. We call them consulates. Um, okay. Armin, do we have any consulates in Nigeria that we oh, can yeah. get Some in touch our... with Leo? Yeah, there we have a lot. We have a lot of consulates in Nigeria. I, I, actually, the, our Nigerian consulates are some of the most popular ones. Out there. So we could provide the links in the description for Atheist Republic Nigerian consulates. Uh, but um, but also, where can we? Can you um, also we link in the description to Leo and where people can follow him? Yeah. So I have the link for his advocacy for alleged witches project. I have the yeah. link for his Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any other information that you want us to provide so people can learn more about what you do, Leo? Hello. Leo is getting cut. Wait. Yeah. At the moment, yeah, it is that advocacy. Hello? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, good. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yes, I, I think that you're correct. We, we have that um, um, uh, advocacy uh, uh, for alleged witches project. Uh, of course, we have on Twitter. Um, we still don't know what the arrest of Mubarak is going to turn to. Yeah, because uh, we are monitoring this slowly. We don't know how long it's going to be because for me, right now, apart from that advocacy project, I spend my time um, around topics related to the arrest of Mubarak, mm -hmm. okay? Because it is, it is a, the arrest of Mubarak is at the heart of the challenge we are facing as free thinkers and atheists in Nigeria. Yes, Certainly. so, so uh, that's where my work revolves around. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think that what I rather did is avenues to make sure that when we do this work, we, we can advertise, we can inform wider audience using your platform and other platforms. So, so that, that's it. And I blog, I send out my blogs occasionally to uh, various websites and all that. I mean, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I, I didn't let Susanna clarify. What did you want, uh, Susanna, what did you do, wanted to do with uh, Leo and the consulates in Nigeria? How did you want us to collaborate? Like what, what was you suggesting? Oh, I don't have any uh, particular idea. I just thought that uh, would be good information. If we have, if right. we have people on the ground there and Leo's right. on the ground there, they should get so, connected. I, Leo, did you know that Atheist Republic has like local groups in many places? I don't know if you have not. You feel like if you were interested in promoting any of your projects or your organization in Atheist Republic's uh, Nigerian consulates, you feel free to like join those groups and. Um, post anything you no, need over no there. No problem. No yeah. problem. No problem. Actually, yeah, I, actually, I'm happy to join a line with them. Um, I have, um, they have a, an AT society. I'm also part of them and all that. So I'm happy right. to join. And especially at times like this, I was telling people that because a lot of people were afraid. They said, ah, that very soon now they will just come after all of us, pick us off, and that will be the end of our movement. You know what I'm telling them? We are going to come out of this stronger. Yes. yes. <laughs> we are going to come out of this more connected. Right. We are going to That's come right. out of this understanding and knowing better who is yes. who and who is doing what. 
This is the yeah. test of international atheist solidarity, and we are going to pass that test. I'm yeah. telling you, we are going to come out in colors. That is why I'm happy to connect with you at Atheist Republic and all the consulates along the world. I'm happy to work with the International uh, Association of Atheists, Atheist Lands International, Humanist, um, Humanist uh, International, and all that. You can see that we are coming now, we are connecting, we are coming out stronger, and this is what I'm telling the police in, uh, in, in Northern Nigeria, release Mubarak. The more you keep him there, the more you make us stronger. You don't right. want to make us stronger, so better release him now so that we yeah. can continue our work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The more they, the more they come after us, the more connected that we're gonna get. The more we're gonna yes. find each other, and the strong it's yes. gonna back every time they attack us. It's just, it will just backfire on them, and they will yes. never learn. They will never learn. Yes, they will not. They will not. They will not. They will All not. Right. Well, that was good. That's a good way to uh, end this conversation. But this was fantastic. I really enjoyed listening to you, Leo. Yeah, it was an absolute joy, absolute pleasure. I learned so much talking to you. We'll be sure to provide all the information related to Mumbark's case in the description below. Um, and we should have you back on again. When yes. we put out the call because we wanted more information about this case, everyone kept saying, you have to talk to Leo. Your name kept on coming up. Either like, he's a firebrand, you need to get him on. And mm -hmm. it was so enjoyable. Thank you so much. And hopefully- well, It's we'll, my we'll, pleasure. Hopefully one, we will one day be able to have a call with you and Mubarak at the same time. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I'm looking forward to that. And actually, when he's speaking, I don't speak because when you listen to his story, it has you. You will you will not. Whatever I'm saying here is like um, like an intro and all that. I mean, he speaks uh. from there and he uses the terminology, and they get hot, you know, and all that. So I have told them, let them choose. You know, mm. do they want me to keep talking on his behalf, or do they want the guy to say the thing the way it is? So they have a choice, you know. But what happens is that the cause Mubarak is fighting will continue whether they arrest him and detain or prosecute him or not. So the people should get used to this and know that we are, again, coming out stronger. Their purpose is to make us weak, let them release him. If they want to make us stronger, let them keep holding him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Amazing. Okay, <laughs> okay so let's um, uh, leave it here now. Uh, so Susanna can mm -hmm. go get to